Good afternoon, Barcellona, and good morning, Washington. Buonasera a tutti e grazie per la partecipazione e il supporto a questo evento internazionale transatlantico sul turismo costiero e sui nuovi scenari che possiamo sviluppare insieme per un futuro sostenibile e consapevole. Capace di superare gli shock e far guardare oltre con audacia e creatività. In questo periodo difficile e duro è infatti importante e urgente dare spazio alla creatività in tutti i campi, anche perché, come sappiamo, nella storia dell'umanità tutte le innovazioni sono nate e si sono formate proprio in tempo di crisi. E queste devono essere un motivo e occasione per un cambio del paradigma della nostra innovazione, di come le nostre società si organizzano e come trovano in equilibrio tra tutte le forze in campo, considerando il fattore ambientale come il fondamentale imprescindibile nelle scelte del sempre più vita. Sono felice di essere qui a Rocca San Giovanni, un angolo del paradiso della costa del Grado di Maruzzo, regione verde e blu d'Europa, in una location speciale, la torre della Regina Montana, e in testimonianza dell'eccellenza e delle autenticità che esprimono le aziende virtuose di questo territorio. Sono emozionata di festeggiare qui un importante anniversario di dieci anni per la nascita della prima giornale alta. Adidas World ha sempre creduto alla sua mission e il nostro impegno è stato costante, nonostante i tempi molto difficili, alternati a grandi successi, importanti premi ricevuti, con il mio progetto per Expo 2015 a Venezia. La Diena Realtà è un'iniziativa itinerante che coinvolge tutto il Mediterraneo per sviluppare migliori e più innovativi progetti sui tempi pilastri di Corbonisti. Heritage Environment in Human Values, patrimonio culturale e ambiente di Valentina. Stanno partecipando alla quarta edizione del 2020 del 2022 della Diena Realtà enti e partners di grande valore di tutti i paesi d'Italia e Euro Mediterraneo, tra cui Egitto, Libano, Tunisia, Grecia, Spagna, Francia, Algeria, Albania, Croazia e Giordania. E molte personalità di grande esperienza di giovani ci hanno offerto il loro contributo per orientare le scelte e sviluppare i progetti che la Diana sta portando avanti, insieme ai partners nazionali e internazionali. Noi siamo già nel vivo di nuovo partner. Stiamo contribuendo a che si possa accelerare il cambiamento in atto e vediamo il futuro luminoso per chi sa far cogliere le potenzialità fin da ora o fare più solo a condividere con gli altri. Voglio ringraziare oggi in particolare il sindaco Giovanni Cesurito che ha accolto la nostra proposta di internazionalizzare il turismo a Napoli attraverso il progetto di promozione del turismo sostenibile e per il quale stiamo lavorando a stretto contatto con Staff Focus in Olanda un network mondiale per programmi di Stato Europeo. Ringrazio la Regione Abruzzo e gli assessori presenti in componente digitale per il marzo, di nuovo, e ci auguriamo possano investire presto e strategicamente i fondi necessari al progetto di rilancio e di produttori, come dei settori emergenti sulla scena mondiale, in linea con i primi dei e i fatti delle Nazioni Unite per il rinnovamento dell'ambiente e per la rigenerazione del patrimonio culturale dei nostri cittadini. A partire proprio da piccoli luoghi, autentici e di storia, tradizioni, linguaggi, aprendovi a molti strumenti di nascita e sviluppo. Voglio ringraziare a San, il nostro padre da Barcellona, che riunisce tutte le carte del commercio di questo Mediterraneo e a chi ha inserito un evento di oggi nel programma ufficiale del Mega Week 2020, il più importante appuntamento del business di innovazione del Mediterraneo su Green e Geocom sulle città sostenibili, sugli investimenti tra Mediterraneo, Europa, Africa e Asia e sulle nuove imprese e professioni da formare per il futuro di Unione, rivolto alle nuove generazioni. In particolare ringrazio Anne De Guatì, il presidente di Ascani, Bianca Moser, Luis Miranda, Anna Bertitos e Juan Diaz, che ci ascoltano diretta a Gerardo. In assoluta differenza di oggi e di Anna Bianca, Apro i suoi giorni con il progetto, collegandosi a diversi contenuti, grazie a lei per il globale, occhi e investimenti. Voglio per questo ringraziare in particolare Sara Carlo per la volontà profusa del suo tempo a capire la conoscenza del grande futuro del territorio. Il nostro webinar internazionale è moderato da due componenti del più grande futuro, dal massimo castigliano e poco in genere. Che si attenderanno a presentare i nostri esperti di eventi che si sviluppano, su quali potranno aumentarci su temi urgenti e importanti per tutto il territorio mediterraneo e oltre. Il 
a questo proposito un'udienza di interventi del segretario generale dell'Unione Parlamentare Isidro Gonzalez e l'esperta delegata della Commissione Europea della Migrazione Centrale Mare e Assemblea. Grazie ancora a tutti per la vostra partecipazione e seguiteci per le altre iniziative della Regione Africa. 2020-2022 in programmazione per il 2021 in diversi paesi del Mediterraneo. Lascio la parola e ringrazio tantissimo al sindaco di Rocca San Giovanni, Giovanni Zurito. Buonasera a tutti o buongiorno, dipende dal fuso orario. Io innanzitutto vorrei ringraziare di cuore eh, tutte quelle persone che in un modo o in un altro hanno lavorato ed hanno permesso a questo piccolo paese, Rocca San Giovanni, di essere protagonista di un evento così importante e di caratura eh, mondiale. Ringrazio la Cantina Frentano, questa meravigliosa eccellenza che abbiamo sul territorio, per l'ospitalità che ci dà questa sera per questo evento, per questa teleconferenza. Eccellenza che sicuramente voi avrete modo di vedere nella visione del video che abbiamo preparato e che vi renderete perfettamente conto di quanto sia importante per il territorio come il nostro una eccellenza del genere. Ringrazio di cuore i miei amici rappresentanti della regione, l'assessore Nicola Gambitelli, l'assessore Damaglio Daniele, e il consigliere delegato Fabrizio Montevara, amici di Merenda, se vi consentite il termine, quando siamo stati con una legislatura in provincia e che conosco benissimo e che ringrazio per l'impegno che sicuramente eh, daranno e faranno eh, per poter fare in modo che questo evento sia soltanto l'inizio di un lungo percorso. Poi successivamente vi sentirete parlare di vicinanza appunto della regione Abruzzo. Rocca San Giovanni è un piccolo paese di 2.400 abitanti che domina dall'alto uno dei tratti eh, di costa più grande dell'Adriatico. Un tratto di costa meraviglioso con la natura che è rimasta intatta per gli anni diciamo sotto tutti i punti di vista. Una costa eh, caratterizzata da delle acque liquide, delle cristalline, che ovviamente anche questo avrete modo di poter osservare nel video e vi rendete conto, ma caratterizzata soprattutto dai trabocchi, da questi meravigliosi strumenti che prima erano delle macchine da pesca e che ultimamente sono stati trasformati in eh, luogo di distorazione, non solo, ma anche in luogo didattici per spiegare appunto a classe, ai studentesi, ai ragazzi, come veniva praticata prima la pesca su queste bellissime eh, macchine da pesca. Eh, di questo poi vi parlerà a lungo e meglio sicuramente l'assessore Enrico Capitelli, perché se questi trabocchi attualmente esistono, funzionano e vanno avanti e sono l'orgoglio del nostro territorio, lo si deve prevalentemente a lui e alla giunta regionale che attualmente c'è, perché l'anno scorso hanno fatto una legge proprio per salvaguardare i, 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 i trabocchi. Di questo poi vi parlerà l'assessore anche. La scommessa nostra era quello di portare praticamente il turista del mare, che praticamente era un turista facile da avere, in quanto le bellezze del mare sono veramente pubbliche, portare questo turista al borgo di Rocca San Giovanni. Perché prima, parlo di anni fa, il turista, il turismo, era prevalentemente sulla costa. Adesso invece, lavorando tantissimo a livello del borgo, eh, siamo riusciti ad avere questo transfer, cioè siamo riusciti praticamente ad avere eh, il passaggio del, del, nel porto anche del turista del mare. Ed è, stato una, è stata una scommessa vita pienamente. Basti pensare che il dati ISTA, il dell'interno del 2019, 
parlando sempre in 8000 presenze di segnalata propria particolare. Ricordo che è un paese di 2400 abitanti. Tutto quanto questo ha portato a uno sviluppo turistico non indifferente, sia per quanto riguarda la ristorazione, sia per quanto riguarda il percortamento, quindi la crescita, la nascita, l'estensione di tempi, di gagnismi, di alberti, tutto però nell'ambito e nel rispetto del corpo amico. Dal 2006 l'Opera San Giovanni fa parte del, dei borghi del prestigioso club dei borghi di Parigi. E da quel momento praticamente ci sta una scadenza da un punto di vista turistico, da un punto di vista di vivibilità, da un punto di vista di cortesia, di, eh, diciamo, di ricevimento del turista in tutti i sensi. Io ho l'onore di essere stato nominato a mesi fa al, nel direttivo nazionale dei borghi di Italia e il mio impegno per questo territorio, per questo territorio San Giovanni, sarà sicuramente eh, notevole in questi cinque anni di e allora. Il borgo di Rotta San Giovanni è visitato tantissimo, è un borgo eh, semplice nel suo consiglio, però è un borgo affascinante, è un borgo che forse ha bisogno di una, spinta, una leggera spinta per raggiungere il massimo che ci eravamo previsti. E io mi auguro che con questi eventi, soprattutto eh, partecipando, eh, dando la possibilità di far conoscere questo piccolo paese in Europa, nel mondo, questo risultato possa essere utilizzato ulteriormente. Io vi invito a venire a Rotta San Giovanni perché vorrei che questo mio destino, il mio paesello, permettetemi di chiamarlo così da un punto di vista affettivo, poi possa avere un posto di scoppio. Quindi vi aspetto a braccia aperte nel Arbor ah, San Giovanni. Intanto passo la parola all'amico assessore di Guterino. Grazie Gianni, saluto tutti i partecipanti a questo webinar. Io vi ringrazio per avermi invitato, per me è un grande onore eh, partecipare a questo incontro perché parliamo di un territorio a me molto caro. E prima il sindaco... Mh, ha, ha, ha annunciato voglio dire un po' quella che è stata anche eh, quella che è la legge regionale che noi come regione Abruzzo abbiamo, abbiamo redatto e scritto e approvato in brevissimo tempo ma bisogna fare giusto un piccolo passaggio indietro perché eh, circa un anno e mezzo fa quando questa, questo governo regionale si insediò i trabocchi eh, purtroppo erano destinati a chiudere Adesso non scendo nei particolari, nei tecnicismi, perché sarebbe eh, molto lungo e forse anche noioso, però ci siamo trovati di fronte a una realtà dove in effetti eh, abbiamo rischiato di avere una costa dei trabocchi senza più trabocchi. Con, eh, potete immaginare eh, quale sarebbe stato il danno, il danno eh, soprattutto di immagine per la nostra regione, per la regione Abruzzo, perché i trabocchi ormai sono visti come una peculiarità non solo del, del, di, questo, di una fascia di territorio, ma bensì come una peculiarità, una bellezza eh, nella quale si riconoscono tutti gli abruzzesi. E quindi un danno di immagine per la nostra regione, un danno sicuramente economico, ma soprattutto anche un danno occupazionale, perché intorno al mondo dei trabocchi comunque vivono circa... Eh, mi sentite? Mi sentite? Ah, ok. Eh, vivono circa eh, 200 famiglie. In 30 giorni abbiamo pensato, ideato, scritto, approvato in Consiglio regionale questa legge, che non è assolutamente un condono, non, è, eh, non dà la possibilità di creare maxi ristoranti sui trabocchi, ma bensì fa ordine, delimitiamo con chiarezza le superfici, il numero, numero massimo delle persone che possono stare sul trabocco e quindi diciamo che così, oltre che a salvare l'immagine della nostra regione, abbiamo salvato tanti posti di lavoro, ma soprattutto credo che abbiamo dato un futuro a quella costa, un futuro legato a uno sviluppo, io credo, del turismo legato proprio alla sostenibilità. Anche perché la costa dei trabocchi 
ha credo una, una valenza ancora maggiore perché eh, ospita al suo interno probabilmente un esempio unico al mondo di mobilità sostenibile che è la via verde proprio de della costa dei Trabocchi. Una pista ciclopedonale di 44 km che parte da Ortona e arriva fino a San Salvo eh, che non è soltanto una semplice opera pubblica ma è un'architettura ambientale intorno alla quale ruotano tantissime, tantissime sensazioni quindi è una, è una pista ciclopedonale pensata sull'ex sedime del tracciato ferroviario delle ferrovie dello Stato quindi eh, vivi in una sensazione tra cielo e mare quindi credo che in effetti sia una sensazione unica e da vivere da vivere da parte di, di tutti eh, in quest'estate ad esempio con tanti turisti che sono arrivati sono venuti qui in Abruzzo sono venuti anche a trovarmi li ho portati sulla costa e sono rimasti eh, sterefatti per la bellezza che noi abbiamo una bellezza incontaminata una bellezza soprattutto naturale dove possiamo riscoprire quelle che sono le, le, le bellezze mh, proprie della nostra costa che fanno quindi un modello unico credo a livello italiano e anche a livello eh, europeo però è anche vero una cosa che la Via Verde sicuramente è l'attrattore principale di questa costa dei Trabocchi, ma da sola non può bastare per creare quel mondo legato al turismo, ma capace di creare ricchezza, creare, capace di creare posti di lavoro. Occorre investire di più. E noi, come Regione Abruzzo, lo stiamo facendo. Lo stiamo facendo sia nella programmazione 2021-2027, dove abbiamo messo altri fondi per sviluppare questa costa dei Trabocchi, L'abbiamo messa nel Recovery Fund, nelle schede che noi come Regione Abruzzo eh, presenteremo quindi al governo e quindi il governo poi in Europa per investire ancora di più su questo, su questo tema e sulla costa dei trabocchi. Perché la nostra volontà qual è? È quella di creare in effetti un modello di sviluppo sostenibile legato al turismo. Perché è chiaro che oggi se parliamo di turismo non si può parlare esclusivamente di turismo fino a... Fino voglio dire a se stesso oggi il turismo deve dialogare in qualche modo con la mobilità sostenibile e proprio per questo motivo al di là adesso dei fondi che noi vogliamo mettere in campo per, eh, per la costa dei trabocchi stiamo mettendo in campo anche le progettualità le progettualità ad esempio una mobilità, una, um, un progetto di mobilità sostenibile su scala regionale per quale motivo? È chiaro che se parliamo di mobilità sostenibile parliamo di un mondo intero, però io mi vorrei un attimino soffermare proprio sulle piste ciclopedonali. Se noi immaginiamo che in passato sono nate tante piste ciclopedonali, che poi sono, erano tutte scordinate tra di loro, invece io credo che sia arrivato il momento di creare un sistema integrato della mobilità sostenibile dove con un modello a pettine, ad esempio dalla Via Verde, con un modello a pettine, arrivare fino all'entroterra e quindi proprio potenziare questo innesto tra costa e entroterra. E quindi in questo modo, se immaginate eh, questo modello ripetuto su scala regionale, capite bene che noi raggiungiamo un duplice obiettivo. Da una parte, in effetti, la valorizzazione turistica anche dell'entroterra perché se tante sono le risorse che noi abbiamo nella, sulla costa altrettanto sono le risorse che abbiamo nell'entroterra ma dall'altra parte credo che raggiungiamo ancora un altro obiettivo forse ancora più nobile è quella, del, eh, è quella delle, le, della riduzione delle emissioni in atmosfera noi oggi viviamo nell'epoca del Green Deal, New Green Deal quindi è l'epoca del, del, eh, dell'Europa più sostenibile su più sostenibile dal punto di vista economico, dal punto di vista sociale ma soprattutto dal punto di vista ambientale viviamo un momento di transizione verde, il che significa che il nostro obiettivo dell'Europa non solo della regione Abruzzo deve essere quella di avere un'Europa più verde io ho avuto, ho avuto la fortuna e l'onore di partecipare al COP25 di Madrid delle Nazioni Unite e lì è emerso un dato importante che se i cambiamenti climatici perché è di questo che parliamo se i cambiamenti climatici non vengono affrontati 
e molte volte si trasforma in un'emergenza climatica e noi in Abruzzo qualche, qualche esempio l'abbiamo avuta. Anche io un saluto come rappresentante della nostra regione Abruzzo, si fa con piacere. Eh, naturalmente, ecco, io mi, per prima cosa vi ringrazio e scu chiedo scusa se mi attivo in, in ritardo. Mi complimento con, con, con te Gianni, con l'amministrazione comunale e tutti coloro che hanno permesso questa giornata importante che poi è un progetto che secondo me ha una visione strategica eh, per il futuro sia del, della tua comunità ma soprattutto io credo dell'intero Abruzzo e fa onore eh, diciamo ecco al, 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 grande, al grande ruolo che secondo me <coughs> deve, devono avere i piccoli comuni perché uno può essere diciamo piccolo da un punto di vista ecco, di pochi abitanti 1700 2000 abitanti ma sicuramente grande di idee, questa di questa sera nella dimostrazione. Questo è un progetto che ecco, ripone al centro poi di, di tutto, di come in ogni parte d'Italia, in ogni parte, anche la più piccola de, della nostra, del nostro Abruzzo, ci sono idee importanti, fondamentali per quello che è lo sviluppo reale e sostenibile. Per cui eh, diciamo che ecco, anche questa pandemia sta facendo riscoprire proprio quella che è la genuità di una, della vita, i valori i più importanti, i valori assoluti, qual è la, ecco, la, il fatto di non poter scambiarsi la mano, di poter avvicinarsi all'altro, sta facendo riscoprire qual, la, la genuinità che si deve avere nella vita quotidiana. E progetti del genere danno eh, la, la dimensione giusta, cioè quella di riappropriarsi del proprio ambiente di approvarsi del proprio territorio, eh, della propria unicità, perché ogni paese, ogni territorio, ogni collina ha la sua unicità e noi dobbiamo essere, noi che viviamo in questi territori, dobbiamo avere la consapevolezza di questo. Progetti del genere, io penso, vanno verso quella strada, cioè avere la consapevolezza di un patrimonio che ci è stato affidato, che ci è stato dato a noi, che siamo di passaggi e che dobbiamo valorizzare per lasciare alle prossime generazioni nella maniera più ottimale possibile. Quindi io come, ecco, come consigliere ti ringrazio per avermi invitato, vi faccio i miei complimenti, ma soprattutto ecco, mi resto a disposizione perché ecco, progetti del genere devono essere assimilati anche dai, eh, ecco, dagli amministratori regionali e portati avanti con grande dedizione, con grande impegno, anche sia a livello ecco, intellettuale ma anche a livello economico. E io sono sicuro che... Ecco, eh, ci sarà una grande corrispondenza tra l'ente locale, l'ente regionale e lo Stato italiano ecco, e quindi a livello europeo. Grazie ancora e di nuovo complimenti. Grazie a te Fabrizio, grazie. Cioè, intanto ringraziamo tutti i partecipanti di questa prima parte di questa giornata del Parlamento di Barcellona e ovviamente gli assessori e il consigliere Antipara sono intervenuti in questa breve introduzione a quello che è appunto un webinar internazionale con esperti di altissimo livello che dalle 5 e 30 saranno collegati sempre con Barcellona e con Washington DC. E voglio ringraziare di nuovo la Cantina Trentana che ci sta ospitando in questa location meravigliosa che eh, più tardi vedremo perché faremo anche uno show cooking eh, con una scelta importante e vi invieremo appunto anche questa ripresa molto importante da Cantina ringrazio di nuovo il sindaco Giovanni per questa opportunità e a Gatwood vuole collegare il livello locale e il livello globale è una grande sfida del secolo se ci pensiamo quindi riuscire a cogliere le opportunità del gruppo di dimensione globale mantenendo e proteggendo le unicità e le unicità del territorio questa è una sfida che solo attraverso i livelli istituzionali possiamo vincere quindi dobbiamo fare squadra su questo come appunto tutto anche l'assessore e il capitello del Partito Nazionale di Consigliere. Grazie di nuovo e ci vediamo. Volevo solo, volevo solo aggiungere una piccola cosa che i successi meritatamente ottenuti eh, da Rocca San Giovanni in questi ultimi anni è il, diciamo, la sintesi di un'unione di squadra, come dicevi giustamente tu. Non è, un uomo a comando non va da nessuna parte. Abbiamo formato, siamo riusciti a creare una squadra di, di compartecipazione, di tempo soprattutto di volere far rendere questo paese vivibile, accettabile, ma soprattutto bello dal punto di vista ambientale, 
educativo e urbanistico. Ci siamo riusciti proprio con la forza di questa squadra. Per cui noi siamo qua, la squadra è qua. E ti lo faccio a te questo, eh, diciamo, questo, questo appello, chiamiamolo così. Facciamo in modo che questo non sia il primo e l'ultimo, ma facciamo in modo che sia un punto di partenza. Certamente sì, iniziamo da oggi e a San Giovanni insomma sarà proiettato nel mondo anche con una talento di Albatrone, sicuramente. Grazie a tutti, grazie a Metalit, ti saluto tutti a Barcellona e arrivederci. A presto. Arrivederci, a presto. Okay, dear friends, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, and uh, depending where you might be, my name is Paolo Giraud from Habitat World, and it is a pleasure to introduce today's topic uh, to our web audience uh, together with my colleague and friend uh, Massimo Castellano. It is a fact uh, that uh, we still have to concentrate our attention to the devastating consequences of the COVID pandemic. In particular, the immense shock to the tourism economy on a worldwide scale. Uh, the latest international estimates on the COVID impact points to 75 to 80% decline in international tourism in 2020. And this could rise up to 85 to 90% if recovery is delayed until spring 2021 or longer. Uh, we expect not. This puts as many as 120 million uh, jobs at risk globally and if international tourism will not recover within specific geographic reason, regions as the one we are considering today, as you can see from the images behind me. We are focusing on the Mediterranean area. To discuss these matters and offer different perspectives, uh, we have with us today a very high profile panel of speakers. Uh, from Barcelona, Mr. Isidro Gonzalez Alfonso, sorry for my pronunciation, the Deputy Secretary of uh, the Intergovernmental Institution Union of the Mediterranean. From Brussels, Belgium, we have uh, Dr. Eleni Aziani, the Policy Officer of DG Mare, European Commission's uh, Directorate for General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. From Greece, Mr. Vasileos Zizimopoulos, uh, the founder of the organization Costa Nostrum, Sustainable Beaches, in the island of Crete, the beautiful island of Crete. Uh, from Tunisia, we have Monsieur Mohamed uh, Mastouri, the tourism expert of Megara, Réseau des Villes Durables. From Italy, we have uh, Patrizia Lupi, uh, the editor and maritime coastal expert of Wista Italy and Shipping and, Tra Shipping and Trade Association from the island of Elba, another beautiful island. Again from Barcelona, Professor Joseph Walz, Valz, the representatives of ASCAME, uh, the Association of the Mediterranean Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and expert from ESADE Business School of Barcelona. From Italy, Professor Armando Montanari, the expert in university business tourism startups from La Sapienza University in Rome. The format for those who are following is to give eight minutes to each speaker. And after that, we will have to, uh, a short Q&A uh, session, question and answers, while other questions uh, that we received during this live streaming will be answered by email following the webinar. So it's now time for our first honorable speaker, His Excellency Isidro Gonzalez Alfonso. Good morning, good afternoon, actually. Uh, we are based in Rome, so it, for, for us it's afternoon. He is the Deputy Secretary General of the Union of the Mediterranean in charge of water, environment, and blue economy since September 2000, 2019. Isidro Gonzalez Alfonso has a wide experience in the Mediterranean uh, region with a special focus on regional integration and negotiations for conflicts, managements and resolutions. So Deputy Secretary General Gonzalez Alfonso, could you tell us 
uh, and our audience, what are your views and the ideas coming from the Union of the Mediterranean on this matter? <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon again from Barcelona, from Spain. A pleasure to talk to you all. Uh, you see behind me the uh, 25th uh, years of the Barcelona process because my organization, the Union for the Mediterranean, we are celebrating next week with a meeting of uh, foreign ministers of, 40, of our 42 member states. Uh, uh, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona Declaration, which was an initiative launched by the government of Spain in 1995. Uh, when Spain was a rotating presidency of the European Union to uh, strengthen the, the, the impact of the European Union in the Mediterranean and to go for an integration, progressive integration of the, of the Mediterranean region. That's the aim of my, my organization, which was born later in 2008 in the Paris uh, summit. So this, uh, uh, that, that's the explanation of this big 25 that I have uh, somewhere the other side here <laughs> behind me. My pleasure and, and my, my big thanks to, to the organizers for inviting me and inviting the, the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, we are, uh, after, uh, Paolo has just said, uh, we are in the middle still of a big, big crisis unattended. We were not expecting with these strengths to be suffering from a pandemic. This, has, is, this is changing all and the post-pandemic recovery uh, will be crucial. And this is where my uh, international organization, Union for the Mediterranean, is, is uh, now focused. Uh, regarding the Mediterranean region and the coastal tourism, uh, uh, well, this is a, we are now in a dramatic situation. Uh, I'm talking from a, a very touristic country like Spain, like it is also Italy, it is also Italy, uh, Greece, Tunisia, mm -hmm. Turkey, etc., etc. All the Mediterranean region is a very touristic area, region. So we are suffering a, a drama uh, of losing uh, jobs, uh, losing opportunities, and, and we wonder all when this will finish and when we'll be back to the numbers, to the millions of tourism, tourists that were visiting, visiting us. The, the epidemiological epidemiology crisis uh, of COVID-19 has strengthened the awareness of the inter inter interdependence between the economies of the different countries especially in fields of primary importance, uh, but very vulnerable at the same time, like tourism and the production chain connected to it. Uh, the tourism economy has been heavily hit, as I said, by the coronavirus uh, pandemic and measures introduced to contain its uh, spread. Depending on the duration of the crisis, uh, revised scenarios indicate that the potential shock could range between 60 to 80 percent decline uh, in the international uh, business uh, tourism uh, in the international tourism economy in 2020, almost 20, 80 percent. This is a drama, and this is a, it means a lot of uh, job losses, and uh, and this is a uh, and this is a big uh, uh, hit to all our economies. In particular, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is having devastating effects on the tourism sector, demonstrating how fragile and how vulnerable it is. Maybe this pandemic will present as an opportunity to revise the, the, the concept of tourism and to go for a, a new uh, understanding of how tourism should develop. I will come, back to, I will come to this later. Uh, uh, sustainable tourism in the Mediterranean is a key priority uh, sector for the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, if, 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 sustain, if tourism is not sustainable, uh, it will be a, a short-term industry. It will not last. Eh? That's why at, at my organization at the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, we are addressing the priorities uh, of uh, tourism in the Mediterranean in a meeting of ministers uh, on blue economy, ministers of um, environment mostly, that will take place in Malta the next uh, in, uh, month of February, the 2nd of February most likely online or hybrid, we will see. Uh, but the next February, the 2nd of February in Malta, uh, all minister of, uh, dealing with blue economy, with the, uh, uh, the sustainability of the sea uh, environment, will meet uh, for, from 42 can two countries, again, our member states in Malta to discuss this and to make further, further progress. Uh, the, our partners and stakeholders, we had a, a, an online consultation already this year in March. It was actually the first online meeting that we had to do because of the pandemic. 
uh, it was mid-March, uh, uh, the, just at the beginning of the confinement of Spain. So we gathered together 500 uh, partners, like stakeholders, participants from different countries of the Mediterranean and other areas. And the conclusion, conclusion they, they reached were, were the following. That, uh, first, that we need, of course, to support the sector tourism uh, in the post-COVID uh, COVID recovery. This is uh, pretty obvious, it has been already said, uh, and it will be uh, an emergency to do that. If not, tourism will not come back in a, as we are expecting. Secondly, uh, uh, we should face over tourism phenomenon and reduce seasonality. Uh, this is also this is also important. We have to create new products uh, in the touristic uh, industry uh, to be offered to the tourists, uh, not only seasonal uh, sun and beach tourism. The third point uh, that we need a di diversification and alternative destinations, uh, as I say, to sun, sea, and sun. We need to go for rural uh, tourism, uh, uh, art tourism. Uh, different. We have to be uh, imaginative. We have to be creative for that. Number four, we should respect and preserve the local identity and nature. Uh, and this is maybe the future of, the, of tourism, that we, uh, by respecting local identity and nature. And this is where we can develop this industry very much. Another conclusion is that the technologies and big data, we, we needed to measure the impact of tourism, predict, uh, predict it and understand tourism flows. And also, uh, our partners, uh, well, they, 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 all, they all say that increasing social and environmental performance through certification labels and ethical codes uh, will be key. For now on, the tourists who will arrive to your countries will not only ask for good hotels and good food, they will ask in many cases the, for the hotels where they will stay to show, to produce a certificate showing that these hotels uh, are respecting uh, 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 the environment, that they are sustainable, they are not consuming too much water. Uh, this is more and more, this is not only a, a, a minority asking for this uh, uh, now. Uh, in my country, in Spain, this is uh, being done more and more in, in, in areas of the Mediterranean and also in the, in the Canary Islands. Also, uh, our partners say that fiscal policies, taxes, taxes, tax benefits and employment incentives are needed to support activities. And especially now, after the COVID-19 pandemic, this will be also another emergency to have these uh, employment incentives. And finally, the promotion of payments for ecosystem services uh, from, for blue carbon will also, be, will also be key. The Union for the Mediterranean has uh, also labeled, uh, has, has approved uh, all our 42 member countries projects such as the uh, such as the one called Med Coast for Blue Growth, for Blue Growth, which is an extension of the Interreg Med Coevolve project to the south, with the contribution of key actors such as the CPRM, uh, which are now pilot, piloting activities in Tunisia and Lebanon on approaches and planning tools to boost sustainable coastal and maritime tourism in the Mediterranean. I remember. It's an anecdote that my first uh, working trip when I joined the Union for the Mediterranean was to Tunisia, exactly, uh, to the uh, Sea Forum, Forum de la Mer, uh, uh, in Bicerte, the beautiful Bicerte, but then also to, to launch this uh, project called Evolve, which meant that uh, a few million uh, euros were, will be devoted in Tunisia to cleaning the beaches, cleaning the coastal areas, because it, the, the tourists, when they come, if, if they, the, the, the challenge with the tourists is not for them to come one, once. The challenge is for them to come back later again, to, to, uh, to make it loyal to the destination. And if they see uh, dirty beaches, uh, dirty coastal areas, these tourists will not come back. They, they will only go to Tunisia, for an example, or to Egypt, or to Spain once. And we need them to come back. So this is very important. It is essential to oversee and further strengthen the areas of cooperation, the only, which is the only tool cooperation for sharing concrete structural and sustainable measures to promote harmonious uh, development of the territories. As mentioned before, territorial communities, uh, regions, and municipalities are at the heart of tourism planning. Therefore, the Union for the Mediterranean has launched a technical assistance activity, a program aim, which, which is aiming at preparing an operational tool to support the recovery from the crisis of the tourism, tourism sector in the Mediterranean. We are fully involved in this. 
this activity responds to the need to envisage a more closer cooperation with local uh, and regional actors to better assess the direct needs of the territories and the protection and also to better assess the protection uh, of the natural, natural environment and the cultural heritage. This set of tools will benefit uh, from the initial uh, inputs provided by a group of highly experienced experts who will work with us and will be based on key principles and relevant aspects as, uh, to promote a resilient model of tourism in the Mediterranean. These tools, I put just a few for you, a few examples, I don't want to get too long. It would be, for, for instance, to design a smart, common uh, and sensible recovery based, uh, based, recovery, uh, based on long-term tools and the right uh, information and data. We need information, we need data to measure the impact of tourism and to learn lessons and to improve. This is obvious. Uh, secondly, we need a particip participatory approach. We need the inclusion of the private sector. This is key. Touristic operators, tourist operators, and environmental actors in the decision-making process uh, as they play a very uh, key, uh, a really key role. <laughs> and third point, a third point could be a third tool, uh, cross-sectorial cross planning for tourism is indeed a very interesting topic. But to be practical, we should consider uh, also the so-called enablers, enablers. Technology and governance are key aspects to be considered. Uh, and infrastructures and fundraising are also crucial. Finally, skills and capacity building represent another important component to be also taken into account. And then we, we also are work, working on, promote, on the promotion of alternative, alternative to the coastal tourism. I said that before, for instance, inland tourism, new touristic alternatives in protected areas, uh, considering the interaction between activities and sectors. Uh, we need to analyze the before and the after scenarios to the pandemic. How was tourism before the pandemic? How it will be uh, after, after? Because it will be somehow, somehow different. <laughs> uh, and there could also be um, being very optimistic. We could even have some positive, few positive uh, consequences of, of the coronavirus in the sector of tourism. Uh, for instance, new ecotourism alternatives, uh, new technological digital businesses, opportunities for local actors for um, fostering uh, for prox proximity, uh, the exploiting the full potential of innovation, but also the integration of the uh, uh, European Union Green Deal principles in the tourist, tourist, uh, tourism sector. Um, so as mentioned before, is, uh, and with this I will conclude, uh, uh, it is important to consider uh, new forms of tourism. It is important to adapt. We have to realize that uh, uh, the situation after the pandemic finishes next year, hopefully, will not be the same. Uh, now the new tourists will be more demanding. They are demanding uh, uh, better sanitary conditions. They are demanding better health services. They are demanding cleaning, cleaning uh, hotels. Uh, more than before, maybe before they were not paying attention too much to that. Now, in the, in the near future, when the pandemic will finish, they will, uh, of course, they, they will ask for clean hotels, clean coastal areas, clean beaches, uh, because uh, health is going to be priority number one, more than before, after the pandemic. So, it's, as I say, it's important to consider new forms of tourism. Uh, which will also task, target local visitors, not only international visitors, local operators, uh, and, 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 and also uh, we need to make the, tour, to, the tourism industry most, uh, more resilient. It is also important uh, uh, to strengthen synergies between uh, related, related sectors like fisheries, restoration, uh, tourism, etc., to maximize the generation of local added value the generation, sorry, of local added value along the value chain of the related sectors. Innovative approaches should be adopted to offer uh, added value and affordable ser services to local communities, in particular, as I say, after the COVID-19 crisis, uh, because foreign tourism uh, will still not come, the, the, especially foreign tourists will not still not come in big numbers uh, as of next year when the pandemic more or less will finish. Uh, it will take some time. It will take some time. We should we should be ready for that and take this opportunity to prepare for a a, a soft landing of the of the new wave of tourists uh, of tourism that will come to the Mediterranean hopefully soon. 
Uh, it is important to consider that the phase of defining innovative strategies for tourism cannot be separated from topics such as environmental degradation and impacts of climate change. Uh, uh, maybe as most of you know that it uh, has been discovered that the Mediterranean region is the second region in the whole planet, in the world, most affected by climate change. Uh, our region is uh, uh, having temperatures raising 20% faster than in the rest of the, of the planet, except the Arctic. So this is a drama. This is a big, big issue. And also tourism has to adapt to, to this, to the impact, uh, the dramatic impact of, of climate change. So with this, uh, I, I, I finished my intervention. It's been a pleasure and, and I look forward to hearing my, my colleagues. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, His Excellency Isidro Gonzalez Alfonso. Uh, we, we are very glad to host uh, also the anniversary of uh, the Union of the Mediterranean, 25 years, and, uh, and to hear your uh, suggestions coming from uh, your partners uh, on new products, new destinations, diversify offers and, uh, and foster uh, I, new identity culture, technology, ecotourism, many, many things. So we now go for, uh, for the second host uh, and uh, it's Massimo Castellano introducing uh, our next guest. Thank you again, His Excellency. Thank you, Paolo, and uh, good evening uh, to everybody. We now quickly move uh, to the next uh, speaker in the panel. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Eleni Tatiani, Policy Officer, DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries of the European Commission. Uh, Dr. Tatiani holds a philosophy doctor and a Master of Science in Marine Ecology and Environmental Geology and a Diploma in Geology and a postdoc research focused on marine spatial planning and integrated coastal zone management. She is contributing to the development of maritime policy and blue economy in the context of sea basin strategies and maritime regional cooperation by focusing on Mediterranean basis as well as on the European strategy of Adriatic Union region. So, uh, Dr. Laziani, my guiding question for you. We will be pleased to hear what are your views and, in particular, the policies of the European Commission with regard to this matter of discussion. Thank you very much. Eight minutes for you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting DigiMar and especially our unit on the uh, sea basin strategies, uh, maritime regional cooperation, and maritime security to your uh, very interesting and important uh, webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, regarding the Mediterranean and coastal tourism, uh, current scenarios and how to shape uh, the future of uh, tourism uh, together. Uh, let me share my presentation so uh, uh, you're uh, able to see it. Is it okay? Can you follow my slides? Yes. Yes, it is. As it has been very clearly described in the last edition of the Blue Economy Report 2020 published by the European Commission, and of course, uh, those that are referred to the figures before the COVID-19 crisis, Blue Economy around Europe represents a large population of the gross Okay. Yeah, we we'll minimize it. Is, 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 is it okay now? I think, okay, perfect. Of the Blue Economy Report 2020, published by the European Commission, and of course, the, this uh, data I was saying that uh, they refer to the period before the COVID 19 crisis. Uh, the blue economy uh, around Europe represents a large potential of the, of the gross added value and total economical turnover uh, when referring to the classical blue economy sectors, uh, but which is uh, uh, coastal tourism, port activities, maritime transport and others, uh, which ha are having a direct positive effect to employment for tourism and other activities related to the living marine resources. Uh, gross value value generated by the tourism uh, sector amounted to uh, be uh, uh, 28.6 billion euro with a 20% rise compared to 2009. 
In 2018, just over half of the EU's tourist accommodation establishments were located in the coastal areas. Visitors to the coastal areas were generally higher in the southern uh, European member states, which are generally more conducive to beach holidays due to the climate conditions. Uh, the European Parliament Resolution on Transport and Tourism in 2020 and beyond supports the development of a 2050 roadmap towards a sustainable, innovative and resilient European tourism ecosystem. The European Commission uh, has organized the EU Tourism Convention last autumn in order to advance the European Agenda for Tourism 2050 a Marshall Plan to support the transition to a green, digital and resilient economy, according to Commissioner Thierry Breton. The recently formed Future of Tourism Coalition, together with a network of supporting tourism organizations, is promoting 13 guiding principles for the future of tourism. And CIRICA Intergroup, the intergroup of our seas, uh, rivers and uh, islands, uh, last summer organized this, a, a webinar with the support of CPMR and the Travel Foundation, where it was highlighted very clearly that uh, recovery from COVID is an opportunity also to accelerate the transition to new business and multi-level governance models, while contributing also to the EU Green Deal and the international climate obligations and the sustainable development goals. Uh, last December, uh, President von der Leyen put the European Green Deal at the center of her priorities. The European Green Deal calls for a transformation to all economic sectors, and of course, blue economy sectors make no exception to that. On the other side, oceans and seas are main enablers for the transition, providing sustainable food, clean energy, and solutions for carbon capture, as sustainable tourism is clearly a sector of the blue economy, which is strongly related to that. Uh, new technologies also for fishing, both recycling, uh, use of fishing materials, etc., other, can contribute to blue circular economy. And a new approach to a sustainable tourism can minimize the environmental impact by also uh, give priority to community participation and poverty uh, uh, re reduction. Uh, actually, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, an ongoing public consultation has been launched for this a new uh, roadmap for a sustainable blue economy, which is still ongoing. So uh, you are um, free and welcome to participate to the public uh, consultation. Uh, looking now closer to Mediterranean basin, as it is, has been uh, very clearly uh, mentioned before by the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Mr. Isidro Gonzalez, there is a lot of significant uh, activity on behalf of the uh, uh, Union for Mediterranean in terms of a uh, Union for Mediterranean Blue Economy Framework. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a uh, Blue Economy Online Stakeholders Consultation last March. There was the UFM and Med Force Association where uh, it was uh, addressed uh, the uh, impact of COVID-19 on ports and maritime transport in the Mediterranean. Also, the European Blue Economy Working Group was a discussion on COVID-19 recovery last uh, uh, September, and we are now currently working on the preparation for the second ministerial conference on blue economy uh, to be organized, uh, to be held last, uh, uh, next uh, uh, February. Apart from that, in the Mediterranean, there is also the significant initiative of uh, WestMed, focusing also on the uh, sustainable development of blue economy in the Western Mediterranean, and of course, on the other part of the basin, uh, the European strategy of Adriatic Union macro region, and especially the pillar four on sustainable tourism, with five flagship priorities, very concrete and relevant towards the sustainability uh, in, the, in the tourism sector. Uh, the UFM stakeholder consultation on blue economy mentioned before, it was uh, uh, conducted in last March, focusing on seven teams, including sustainable tourism, sustainable maritime transport and ports, by receiving more than 300, 350 recommendations by 100 uh, entities, uh, which uh, contributed to the specific uh, uh, consultations. Uh, and coming closer to the themes for sustainable tourism and sustainable maritime transport as for its, its, its report, clear messages have been pointed out. 
how to support the sector uh, uh, towards the recovery from COVID, how to face the over-tourism and reduce seasonality, uh, issues regarding diversification, alternative destinations, uh, how to respect the local identity and the natural, the ICT technologies and big data, how to increase the social and environmental performance through certifications, labels, and ethical calls, fiscal policies, taxes, benefits, promotion of payments for ecosystem services and blue carbon, a look into sustainable maritime transport and ports, the transition to new vessel concepts and not uh, diesel engines to so zero emission, adequate port waste facilities, implementation of pollution related conventions, digitalization, speed up administrative processes. Uh, CPMR, the Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions, and especially uh, the Inter-Mediterranean Commission of CPMR, has published very recently. A, a study on tourism in the Mediterranean by focusing uh, on the impacts, uh, the measures, uh, and the state of the art uh, following the COVID 19 crisis, but also uh, addressing as an opportunity to the sector to evolve towards more sustainability. Uh, in view of, of the um, uh, significant impact of the COVID 19 outbreak, the responses to face the crisis in the Mediterranean according to this study, have been of different types and reach. In parallel with a variety of measures implemented at national level, Mediterranean regions have sometimes launched further initiatives to support the sector. And on a national level, general economic and fiscal interventions to support more most affected enterprises have been largely promoted by most countries in the Mediterranean area by aiming at ensuring and ensuring the necessary the necessary cash flow support for micro and the SMEs and all self-employed professionals. Um, but uh, looking to uh, how to, to, to go further uh, into a, a, a sustainable approach uh, for the tourism sector, the cooperation is very, very important. And first of all, let's have a look in the cooperation through clusters because clusters are enablers of the cooperation as they engage together very significant parts of the, of the, of the helix of innovation as we used to, 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 to refer to the federal helix of innovation by engaging together uh, the research and academia, the public and the private sectors, the society. And if we have a look in the maritime clusters in the Mediterranean, uh, here we have uh, some of the most active, uh, important maritime clusters in the Mediterranean. Tourism uh, is one of their major pillar in terms of their activities of engagement of those important uh, uh, parts of innovation uh, in the Mediterranean area. Uh, apart from the clusters, uh, cooperation uh, among countries, among regions is very important. Just to have an idea in respect to the interreg program of the current period on 2014 2020, uh, around 2,000 projects for sustainable tourism and cultural heritage have been, have been uh, uh, successfully implemented. And of course, other programs like the NECBC BED uh, or other initiatives which are very important for the Mediterranean area. And uh, regarding the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, and speaking uh, for the call uh, on nautical routes for Europe with a budget of uh, uh, 1 million and 50,000 uh, euros and with a large number of proposals received, five very important uh, funding projects, the Tuna route, the WOW route, the Meltemi, the CSR and the Magna have been very successfully implemented uh, at, the, at the Mediterranean by covering, and we, as we can see in the map, a very uh, large uh, geographical area at the Europe uh, beyond Mediterranean, uh, focusing on the specific issue. So, uh, thank you very much. I will be very pleased to hear any questions and contribute to further the discussion. And then, of course, you can contact us for any further detail we can provide you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Ayani, a very interesting presentation, especially for the figures concerning the value of the blue economy and in this field, the strategic role of the maritime affair and blue tourism. So, thank you so much for your contribution and uh, try to go on with the next Thank you. Okay, okay, again. Uh... Uh, thank you, Massimo, and thank you, uh, Dr. Eleni Aziani. 
Uh, with DG Mare and Union of the Mediterraneans, we end the chapter dedicated to institutions and to move to three district uh, realities in the Mediterranean uh, representing regional actions. And the first one comes from beautiful Greece uh, and in particular the island of Crete. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Vasileios Zizimopoulos. Uh, he has received various awards for his work uh, on coastal management and coastal ecotourism and he is the CEO of the technical office Aelia Sustainable Engineering and CEO founder of the triple award winning startup company Costa Nostrum Limited. He has two Master of Science degrees uh, and, uh, in energy and sustainable development and environmental conservation and management. Since 2019, he is also uh, a monitor, a mentor in two incubator programs for startup companies, and he's also a member of the standing committee of the environment of the Technical Chamber of Greece, Department of Eastern Greece, Eastern Crete, sorry. Uh, Mr. Zizimopoulos, good morning. Uh, having a uh, good afternoon again. <laughs> having heard uh, the two previous speakers, uh, what are your reactions and reflections from Crete? Thank you, Mr. Zizimopoulos. Yes, hello and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here. So, uh, let me share my screen and in order to present my presentation. Just a moment. Can you see it all? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay, so. Oh, so, okay, let me, okay. No, come on. Okay, sorry for that. Let me see what can I do. Okay, so, yes, hello again. Uh, we'll talk about uh, beaches and more specific about sustainable, sustainable beaches and how we can develop and management our Mediterranean beaches with a more sustainable way. Our mission in Costa Nostrum, our mission is uh, through Costa Nostrum Sustainable Beaches Protocol is to transform every public or hotel beach to a world-class five-star or four seahorses sustainable beach. What we are up against? What are the pressure in which the beaches are under? more than 100 million tourists on the Mediterranean coast during every summer. It is uh, estimated to have more than 50% annual growth rate with more than 500 million tourists until 2030, overcrowding, collapsing ecosystems, negative impact on tourism coming, and more or less of more than 100% in beach popular pollution due to tourism. What is the challenge about? Current solutions are inadequate. No recognized sustainable beach management system. Current solutions are fragmented with multiple points of failure. No immediate upstream to sustainability. No scale free, no place free. Every beach has its own unique characteristics. How Costa Nostra meet this challenge? We deliver a holistic solution. We bring together many partial solutions. Action is taken at the level that is closest to the real world of places, and community and st stakeholders are engaged. We have about 39 criteria environmental, social, and economic. Why now? Because the demand for sustainable beaches is increasing, and because satisfied tourists promote the destination, municipality, or end the hotel increase competitive advantage, increase revenues, they come back often, bring friends and family, stay larger and spend more. We have until now 12 certified Costa Nostrum sustainable beaches, so we have the know-how to expand in multiple beaches across the Mediterranean Sea. And because, and probably is more, 
probably the more important because COVID-19 proved the need to move towards a more sustainable tourism model. Our value proposition is that we, uh, we have engaged COVID-19 preventive measures and guidelines for business, a new protocol for COVID-19 business was created on May. If you don't measure it, you can't about sustainability, identify the replace good practices, objective rating scale of sustainability, go further than innovation, global promotion of the certified business, increase property unique selling point and brand perception, increase satisfaction of customers. And of course, increase of customers. We have affordable solutions for public and hotel businesses. The last four years, we have a rise of 240% in certified businesses. Tourists love certified coastal hosting businesses, and, they, and we have proved it through our question surveys for more, from more than 5,000 tourist questionnaires. We have several distinctions awards where we are nominees in two categories in the European Business Awards for the Environment. We have two awards at the Greek Business, Business Awards for the Environment. We are good practice in two European programs. And we have an international award. We have some national award. And we, uh, we, have, uh, we had a successful participator, participation in three incubator programs. We have several business partnership and clustering with governmental organizations, with certification organizations, and with several others across Greece. And at the end, we want the sustainable future for the, for the tourism sector. That's why in this effort, we want to collaborate, we want to collaborate with countries, organizations, regions, municipalities, hotel and business across the Mediterranean Sea that have the same vision and aim with us, sustainable future of the tourism sector. And this is my last. So thank you very much. And I am on your disposal for any questions. Okay, thank you, um, uh, <laughs> Mr. Zizimopoulos. We look forward to, to be back in, uh, in Crete very soon. And uh, I love personally uh, Kania and uh, Elafonisi Beach, of course. And uh, we wish to be back uh, uh, very again soon. Uh, we Why move not? now to <laughs> yes, thank you. We move now to our next speaker across the Mediterranean. We are now in uh, Tunisia. Monsieur Mohamed Masturi, an expert in tourism uh, for the Megara Réseau des Villes Durables. Uh, Mohamed Masturi has a master's degree in uh, tourism studies, professor at the Higher Institute of Tourism Studies of uh, Sidi Drif in uh, Tunis. He's also an entrepreneur uh, of a top travel agency, Sunline Travel Tunisia, and considered to be one of the main experts on tourism in the Maghreb and Arab region. Bienvenue, Monsieur Mastouri. Bonsoir. Uh, bonsoir. Hello, everybody. May, may, may we much. ask you? you know. Yes. <laughs> may we so, ask you uh, how today's topic is being considered from the Tunisian and Arab point of view in the Mediterranean tourism? Merci. So, good morning, good afternoon um, for everybody, and thank you for the invitation. So, as he said, I'm expert of Megara Network, and uh, I'm mainly going to, uh, to speak as an expert as well of tourism as I'm very well involved in the COVID-19 corona coronavirus. In fact, um, just to, uh, to speak a little bit about the impact of coronavirus uh, on the uh, touristic sector in Tunisia, which was, as all the sector businesses, uh, the business sectors, in fact, um, uh, very well impacted. However, it seems that the tourism sector in Tunisia, as we are very well, very based on tourism activities, um, it was the most affected one. And based on the Tunisian National Tourist Office, um, it's more uh, catastrophic consequences of this global health crisis on this sector, which contributed 
to 13.9% to the GDP in 2019. And um, um, I'm sorry to give you some uh, just uh, uh, details about the impact in, in Tunisia, first of all, um, which means that the total of tourists uh, in Tunisia, a total of one, just 1,366,958 1, travelers arrived to Tunisia between January the 1st and July the 10th, which means a decrease of 67% compared to the same period uh, in 2019. The number of the Tunisians resident abroad who visited Tunisia during this period um, uh, didn't reach more than 200,081 uh, compared to the same period in 2019 uh, which is a quite a, a, a decrease as well of 51, 59.1%. According to the same document, and just to understand how impactful was the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, on, on this country, which could be taken as an example for the southern countries in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, according to the same document, the French, Russia, German and English markets appearing on the list of markets having experienced huge drop compared to the previous year. And uh, I'm just going to uh, give you the example of the Russians, which goes 200 times less than the previous year, which means 2019. In fact, here in Tunisia, everybody speaks about the sustainable tourism which is not more uh, a new word. And all the professionals uh, have heard at least about the sustainable tourism. The problem uh, is the, uh, the um, administration in Tunisia, as we have a very old administration, and um, people say more, uh, let's talk about social tourism, which leads to sustainable tourism, which means we are trying more and more to involve people uh, inland in this activity. As we worked for a long time, for more than 50 years in Tunisia, uh, in the coastal tourism, uh, just in the coastline, and this which made the big difference between uh, the cities, as most of you know, like Hamamet, Sous, uh, and the island of Jerba, uh, this activity made a big difference between the coastline and the interior of the country and which pushed people from inland country to think that tourism is not a benefit uh, for them. And this is a, a big mistake, uh, but let's say it's a mistake which was as well done by the government as most of people inside land were not really involved. And here we try uh, uh, with what we have, in fact, uh, as professionals, um, with the means we have, is to try to convince people and to work with the uh, local people, uh, mainly in the small villages, which could be uh, touristic destinations in the future. And we think, honestly, just yesterday, uh, I had a meeting with some uh, colleagues and we were speaking about the sustainable tourism and the importance of sustainable tourism and to start um, working more and more about this uh, concept. We think, of course, everybody is speaking now about the um, negative impact of the uh, COVID-19, but uh, we think that it could be as well, it could have as well a very positive impact if we start working right now about uh, the period after the COVID-19 and the importance of the sustainable tourism. Um, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez Alfonso, uh, when he started, he gave us a lot of ideas and we share completely, in fact, all the ideas with him. And that was the subject of uh, the, this meeting uh, I, I told you uh, we made yesterday between professionals in Tunisia and uh, to start speaking in like um, um, as well uh, in what we call the digital transformation of the tourism 
in this country. Um, we hoped uh, until the end of the first wave um, of um, Corona virus, when we started working for the f two, three months in the high season, which means July, August. But unfortunately for us, uh, we started again, the speaking about, as everybody knows, about the second wave uh, and, and, um, of the uh, coronavirus. And this uh, made as well a big problem for us as we are speaking about curfew now in Tunisia, which is going to create a big problem for the, um, all the uh, professionals in tourism, in tourism hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, transportation as well. In fact, um, we think and we hope that this is not but a beginning to start um, explaining to the locals here the importance of the sustainable tourism and the importance of the activity of tourism as, uh, as I told you, as a social uh, activity. And here, I would like just to, um, to explain that tourism and sustainable tourism could be a, a very important solution, mainly to stop the illegal immigration to Europe. Uh, I'd like to tell you that the, those who leave the country, they think that when they go to Europe, this is the American dream. And that if once they put their legs in, in Europe, it's going to be the paradise for them. But if we finish by giving them, um, convincing them about the importance of tourism and the intervention of tourism in the uh, uh, local, for the local people and in the small villages forever, and this is what we mean, in fact, by speaking about the sustainable tourism, by respecting um, uh, the environment, um, by making them uh, or helping them convincing them, teaching them how important is tourism, that could be a very positive side after the uh, coronavirus. Um, in fact, as um, we think, in fact, that the situation continues to deteriorate uh, uh, immediately during the, this next few months, um, which could be perhaps irreversibly as well for several reasons. Um, and to finish um, by uh, convincing the locals uh, by the importance of the sustainable tourism after the coronavirus, we need solutions which must be as functional both in the very short term and in the long term. In this regard, uh, in this period of the health crisis, exceptionally, exceptionally uh, we need to take exceptional measures uh, which must correspond to this exceptional uh, context. Um, to do this, uh, priorities and forecasts must change in order to unleash the energies and have the courage and determination necessary to save our tourism. Faced with such a situation, the country must resort to non-traditional policies in an exceptional context given that the crisis will have major social effects uh, with the rise in unemployment, uh, with a high degree of uncertainty which characterizes the future. Um, that's all what we think. This is our point of view, in fact, uh, which turns around the word, the magic word, which is sustainable tourism. And uh, um, I hope to have the opportunity to share with you our point of view, the local point of view, as we are very agree and we agree very much with all what was said to involve locals, to help uh, the green, uh, the blue tourism, the green tourism, and uh, to go further inside the countries, all, all over the countries, uh, and to uh, help uh, the sector to be as important as it was. And thank you very much. Okay, merci, merci, Monsieur Mastori. Uh, it's good to hear another voice uh, talking about uh, uh, the diversification of uh, tourist uh, offer. And uh, yes, we have to to, uh, to to 
to give a message, loud message, that Mediterranean is not just beaches, it's culture, it's food, it's uh, people. So uh, we, we need a new approach to this matter. Now we get, uh, thank you again, Mr. Masturi. Uh, we go uh, back to Massimo, introducing their next uh, guest from Italy. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, now the third speaker from the Mediterranean area come from Italy and uh, from Elba, island of Elba. Mrs. Patricia Lupi. Mrs. Lupi is a journalist specialized in maritime economy and transport. She has directed several magazines in the maritime and logistics sector. In 2010, she won the prestigious Mare Nostrum Journalist Award, and she held classes of maritime economy and logistics for training institutes and universities throughout the Mediterranean. She was for 10 years the Civita Vecchia Port Authority Coordinator, and currently she is the Director in Chief of Enjoy Helpa and the Tuscan Archipelago Magazine, CEO of the Comunicazione Limited Company, and she is in the board of the Highland of Elba Foundation. She's also a member of Vista Italy, Woman International Shipping and Trading Association from 1996, and uh, she's a key member of the board. Mrs. Luby, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Greetings from so, me and again, the Vista Italy members, the association I belong to. Vista okay. is an international association of women. Yes, the Women International Shipping and Trade Association. Yes, the yes. International So, uh, yes. a direct question for you. What is the situation in Elba and what are your views and what could be done in the future? Thank you. Eight okay. minutes for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, WISTA is an international association of women, uh, managers who work in the maritime economy of over 50 50 countries uh, in the world. Every two years, uh, the Wista ladies of the Mediterranean meet to talk about the future of our sea and international trade. Uh, I think that the name Mediterranean implies its destiny. It means Middle Sea, where water is uh, an element, a symbol of union, not separation. It's a particularly favorable ecosystem, but also an ideal topos that connects the three continents and the three civilizations, all equally rich, though different. The sea routes traced by people of the past generated a dense network of exchange of goods, ideas, knowledge, technologies, creating the canvas on which the Mediterranean civilization took shape. Today, the routes are not only for trade, but also for tourism. Over 50 million people in Italy are transported on comfortable fast ferries to many destinations. But what impact have tourism on our coast, on our islands? I am lucky to live in a beautiful place in the Mediterranean, the Tuscan Archipelago. Seven islands that are called the pearls of the Tyrrhenian Sea, remembering the legend of the birth of Venus. They have been an important place for the history of the Mediterranean since ancient times. They were inhabited by the Etruscans, by the Romans. Cosimo de' Medici during the Renaissance had built the capital Cosmopoli, today, today's Portoferraio, on the island of Elba, the largest of the seven. Like mine, all the islands of the Mediterranean are jewels rich in history, beauty, biodiversity but have so many critical issues for transport, health, school, everything costs more. They are islands that need to be treated and safeguarded. The first economic resource for the islands is tourism, partly agriculture and fishing, but principally for tourism. But precisely because they are a tourist destination, they risk being too chaotic in summer and being empty in winter. 30,000 people live in Elba, but in the summer tourists exceeded a million visitors. In a situation like this, 
It's the environment of the sea, of the heart, first of all, that must be defended. Nobody would uh, come and take a bath in a tube full of plastic or take pictures of a pile of garbage. We have a national park that defends a large part of the land and the coasts. But since 1982, we have been waiting for a marine protected area. It doesn't exist yet. It's important to talk about sustainable tourism from environment, social and cultural point of view. We need a new solution. Many things are changing with the COVID-19, especially people's need. We are all paying attention to the environment where we live and where we spend a holiday. Cruise tourism is also changing not only for safety on ship where thousands of people live together, but also for destination, cities of art, for example. We are currently experiencing great difficulties and a drastic decrease in the number of tourists, I think, to Florence, to Rome. Last summer, we recorded in the island a growth in nautical tourism in our highlands, but even in this case, new safety measures must be adopted to safeguard the inhabitants of the tourist <laughs> resource because the control on board is less. July and August were months with an above average turnout. Many Italians decided to stay in Italy and flocked to the islands because they were considered safer and with a less contaminated environment. But the infection spread again in, in September. Many things are changing this year, even the holidays. We all need safety. We appreciate the life and the open air. We are more curious. We want to know the tradition of the place we are visiting. We are travelers rather than tourists. We want to, to eat traditional dishes and prefer zero kilometer products or wine for, from local producer. We are looking for handmade objects and typical products. The tourist targets have also changed. Many retires look for places for live away from the chaos or loneliness of the city. So young people who want to bring up their children in nature. More and more are the smart workers who can walk, who can walk from anywhere, even from, from an island. I believe that the islands can be an example for a new tourism where people want to become part of a community. In Tuscany, in Italy, an opinion movement is going on to populate the small ancient villages that risk being abandoned. For this reason, it's very important to welcome tourists in a friendly way and to tell them about the place, the, the characters, the habits of life. If you know a place, you will love it and take care of it. This is what I'm doing with my magazine, Enjoy Elba and the Tuscan Archipelago. This is what we are doing with the tour operators and cultural association of our islands. We are launching a project to populate archipelago in autumn, winter and spring. The name is Elba Forever Beautiful. The weather here is fine. Today we resist 20 degrees. People still swim in the sea. You find the, the beaches with children playing in the sand. People eat outdoors. Winter is also mild and there are clear days where it seems that all the seven parts of the Tyrrhenian are shake hands. We have the great Corsica in the background, a few miles away, and it seems to be in a large lake. After all, the Mediterranean is a large lake where the most ancient civilization have grown up. We must be proud of it. We have it all learned from each other and we should continue to do so. Now more than ever, because we have understood that an invisible virus is enough to stop us. It doesn't matter if we are French or Italian, African or Arab. If you are rich or poor, blonde or dark, <laughs> only unite can we be able to win and move on the road of progress. But to prosper and welcome travelers from all over the world, we need to be healthy 
and in peace. I hope that a conference like this will help the dialogue between all the shores of Mediterranean Sea to write a shared project for the future. Good job, everyone. So, thank you very much for your suggestion. Uh, you have raised also the question of uh, over tourism on the island and uh, over the coast. Uh, the question will be managed by Professor Armando Montanari later on. So I hope to be able to come back to talk about uh, Vista Italy and Elba Island very soon. Thank you again. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Joseph Valls. Professor of ESADE, the Business School of Barcelona, and a global expert on tourism of ASCAME, the Association of the Mediterranean Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Professor Valls uh, teaches at the Barcelona-based uh, ESADE Business School in Tourism Strategy. He is also visiting professor of the SDR Bocconi School of Management in Milan, uh, the Universit Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. Uh, the Universidad Antonio de Nebrilla, the UCA in Managua, <laughs> so many, and the Escuela de Alto Studios de Hotelería y Turismo in Havana, Cuba. He is uh, the author of a number of books, amongst which uh, we remind everyone sustainable tourism destinations management. So welcome, dear Mr. Professor Valls, after having heard uh, the previous speakers, what are your thoughts about the present and the future of sustainable coastal tourism in the Mediterranean? Thank you. They are uh, president, they are chairman, uh, all colleagues, ladies and gentlemen in the, this uh, virtual presentation. I want to explain something about the innovation, the innovation opportunities that COVID offers in the Mediterranean uh, it's a uh, very pleasure to present myself to this international audience of the Mediterranean from Barcelona City. As a... Perdona? Presentación. Eh? Presentación diapositivas. Okay. Ahora. Okay. Okay. I want to speak about the innovation and it, uh, it's a very pleasure to present myself in this internet audience. As a teacher, analyst and consultants on tourism and digitalization, we cannot deny that we live in very delicate moments but along with important threats appears opportunities to make the leap. Euromonitor say there are many sectors of the tourism that accelerate domestic tourism, adventure tourism, nature, beach, wellness, luxury, uh, kilom uh, kilometer O, camping, there are many disaccelerating too, as long haul, insustainable models, or mass tourists. Because the new values of tourists are a slow tourism, a small tourism, more intimate and less massive experience, more premium, hyperconnected and digital people, implicated too in services, and uh, more expensive uh, the tourist uh, services and more profitable sector. Several uh, weeks ago, The Guardian asked uh, in the, some, re, some report, is the end of the tourist. But in the same lead of this article, say The Guardian, uh, the, the reply, reinvent. And when we say uh, what is the reinvent is because we are a imaginative sector, tourism, 
who knows how to reinvent. No matters the output when the experts continue, continue to draft figures for the exit of this pandemia. It does not matter too that government have completed the steps in the face of the pandemic or not. Public money to serve the strategic sector during the pandemic, public money for the restructuring and repositioning the destination of the tourist company, and search for exit to those who disappear. One one question that I said in the last four weeks and in the last month. No more regret, but face the new scenario. Because the reinvention must to do on hard and soft scoops in the company and, more, and in the destination. In online or, or online or of or, or life and reinventing the business model based in the digital tool, digital tool of production, relationship, etc., etc. <coughs> we should drink, uh, we should think, excuse me, less about the large building and more about more intimate space. less crowded beaches and more spaced, clean and adapted beaches. More in gastronomy of kilometer O products. We should think more in cultural focus, in fishing, in nautic sports, in beach city with shopping centers and complete services throughout all the year, more than in other areas next to the beaches for the summer. When uh, Eleni explained what asked the European community about uh, the, the future of the tourists, explain all that. Two, in, uh, in internal processes improvement to allow us to digitize either processing the excellent measure uh, have been implemented uh, to have COVID-3. Either excellent measure uh, looking for the new activity for hotel real estate in co-working or in co-living or using the digital tour, the tools for gastronomy business, such as these pop-ups open in Barcelona based on central cuisine, communication uh, through Instagram and brought home by riders of notable success during this month on November of November here in Barcelona. Other many activities that produce in this moment as innovation. Four years ago, I published a study of the expectation of the uh, 300 Spanish coastal population, coastal city, for 2020. They wanted to maintain as seaside, you can see in the red one globus, but increase the gastronomy, increase the culture and heritage, increase the event, increase water sports, shopping, ecotourism, fishing. That means the uh, people working in, uh, in uh, coastal uh, area expand, uh, expect expanding in services and public extending the season for the whole year, emphasize on product session by the sea. That means 
like uh, the sunflower that always seek the sun. I have prepared a roadmap to finish of six steps to take uh, advantage of the COVID in the service of the improvement of the Mediterranean. Firstly, you have to act now. Even if there is a third wave of COVID, we cannot be compliant. Second one, fever international tourists will come. Therefore, it will be necessary to pamper local, national, and very interesting new audience much more. Third one, it will be necessary to reduce the tourist plant in general, shops, hotels, restaurants, and other services, and take advantage of it to increase the size of small and medium-sized Mediterranean tourist companies through a chain, a chain uh, through a cooperative or purchasing services another company for the price of tourist services must be higher adjusted to the real value and that will produce better wage and greater contribution to GDP in the Mediterranean countries. Five effective public public and um, private cooperation without historical misgivings and six one decentralization of tourist asset to the second and third square miles around the beach. Summarizing, no more regret but face the new scenario. Imagine it and work together public sector and private sector to reinvent it. Decentralize the tourist plant to the second or third square mile. Prepare the company for the new clientele. In addition, take advantage of digitization to improve the profitability of tourist business. Blue and digital transformation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Valls. Uh, it, uh, it was interesting, as in every uh, SWOT analysis, to hear the word opportunities opportunities uh, forced by the COVID-19, but uh, anyway, opportunities. And a positive word like uh, reinvent tourism. This is very, very, very uh, positive message you're leaving to our audience today. Thank you. We go ne to our next guest, introduced by Massimo again in Italy again. So ready to go. We have now our last guest and we are connected from Italy, Rome, with Professor Armando Montanari, a top expert on tourism in the Mediterranean, as he has held the post of professors and president at La Sapienza University of Rome School of Tourism, before taking up the position of deputy president at the Sara Envy Mob Limited Company, Sapienza University Innovative Startup, which targets nature and tourism-based solutions. He has been the author of about 300 scientific articles and volumes in Italy, English, French, Spanish, and also Japanese. <laughs> so, Mr. Montanari, Professor Montanari, uh, I got a question for you. Starting from your experience and studies concerning the phenomenon of over-tourism affecting various parts of the Mediterranean, including the Roman coast in Italy, what should we expect as a development of coastal tourism once we return to normal condition? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Castellano. Um, thank you very much for having invited me to this interesting uh, event. And also, I had uh, the privilege uh, to be the last one. I've been following numerous, uh, all interesting uh, um, presentation. And uh, I agree with the most of the issues that uh, have been presented. Well, I'm going to start uh, concerning one uh, term, over tourism, which has affected, until February 2020, numerous coastal cities located on the northern coast of the Mediterranean, such as Rome, Barcelona. Yeah. Mm. 
Where is the, my camera? Where is my camera? Ah, yeah, I said now, now it's okay. <laughs> well, okay, now I'm not moving anymore the camera. Okay, over to, as, a, as, a, as was mentioning, coastal city they have been affected by world tourism which are uh, as i mentioned uh, barcelona art and genova venice istanbul more or less all the mediterranean cities the term of tourism has only been used in the international literature for a couple of years um, to identify an excess of tourist presence in small areas for a limited time the term was introduced into common use by scholars of fishing. Uh, why, we, we could say, what has to do fishing with the tourism? Um, well, the concept that inspired those scholars was linked to the fact that the term over means exploiting the supply of fish as well as tourism and leisure up to the risk of exhausting. So the problem is that over tourism has been risking just to destroy tourism. In tourism, running out of resources means reducing the quality of the experience, the visitors worsening the living condition of residents, trivializing the cultural and environmental resources of the offer. Although the term was recently introduced, international organizations such as the OECD, the European Commission, as well as research institutes, scholars from a number of universities have been warning public authorities of the risk of drying up tourism resources and thus destroying demand for decades. Well, this is a major point because we knew all now for many years, I remember the OECD publishing a report, uh, it was the 80s, so 40 years ago, but what has been done? For me, it was done very little, nothing. So I think that uh, now we have to imagine that uh, we hope, as also some of my um, of the contributors that I interviewed before me, that uh, COVID-19 is probably contributing to make, could be contributing to make the miracle. COVID-19 suddenly reduced national and international human mobility and decimated tourist presence. One example among many in the crowd of tourists was gathered in the front of the Trevi Fountain in Rome and waved to reach the edge of the water to be able to take a selfie, only a selfie, or even a selfie, which is a lot, but to immediately publish on their social network. Starting from March 2020, the space in front of the Trevi Fountain is empty, a desert. The shouting of the mass of tourists was replaced by the silence, broken only by the running of the water in the fountain. Now, the problem is to introduce financial and regulatory instrument to return to the previous situation. So far, the competent administration have followed this path to reduce the economic losses suffered by numerous operators once active in the sector. Instead, I propose, but I am not alone, because all the intervention today have been in this line. Uh, we propose policy tools that cite the opportunity of the pandemic crisis to completely change direction and try to avoid in the future those mistakes that have been made for too long in the past. Rather, by using the slogan, nothing will be the same. Because uh, till now, I heard, at least in my country, everything will be the same. No, nothing will we have to be the same in tourism at least. Therefore, it appears necessary to study the recent past to avoid making the same mistakes again. Over tourism was caused by a series of parameters such as uh, tourist density, the supply of beds per square kilometers, tourism intensity, the ratio between the number of tourists and the number of residents, the offer of beds from the IBNB network, the contribution of tourism to the formation of the gross domestic product. The intensity of our connection, arrivals of travelers at the nearest airport in relation to the number of residents. Proximity of an international airport. The proximity of a port where cruise ship dock. The proximity of UNESCO cultural heritage sites. Of course, every of these issues, uh, we should devote uh, a, a speech, a devote a conference, but uh, I just summarize in this way. This condition were then the basis of a series of other services and activity that are known by the term of low cost, low cost. And that can be applied to the trip, low cost airlines, to the stay, Airbnb, to the visit, low cost pass through, and so on and so on. 
the concept of low cost is certainly positive. It's very useful. I've been also helping uh, um, new, new kind of tourists just to travel to go around the world. But from a theoretical point of view, in reality, it poses the low cost, poses high cost to the community of tourist side, to other visitors, to natural cultural heritage. In the case of Rome, tourists are offered an area of high artistic value, which, however, is of little relevance to the people of to over tourism. We're not interested in these beauties, but due to over tourism, we experience the overcrowding of public spaces, the private use of public spaces uh, to uh, part of bars, restaurants, sellers uh, that use public space, the increase in the commercial value of buildings, and therefore the expulsion, the expulsion of residents, the imbalance of the number of residents and visitors, a change in the commercial offer, the degradation of environmental resources, the increase in the production of waste where treatment is paid for by residents, the increase of noise pollution at the, all hours of the day and night, deterioration of high water quality. There are many elements that make us believe that the resumption of travel and international tourism may be slow as we heard also before myself the intervention and therefore in the short term it will be mainly be proximity tourism and therefore a demand that arises in the same places where the offer is located. There is therefore a need to improve the offer and make it compatible with the following condition. A low impact on the cultural and natural heritage, the tourist must be increasingly aware of the values of the audience, of the experience, the tourist contributes to the protection of the offer and not to its destruction, involve residents as an active part of the offer, keep tourist profit as locally as possible, involve local residents and other business in improving the quality of the offer. Currently, in the areas of no cost of metropolitan area of Rome, there is the presence above all of small and very small tourism uh, business, sometimes even family-run ones. To support the principle mentioned above, it will be necessary to help these small dimension companies to organize training courses to reorient their staff professionally. Formation is necessary. And, uh, and so we have uh, to organize in this way that uh, will be possible um, to help them with training, with training courses, and also with uh, a new way of using information and communication technology because uh, we have to improve the quality of uh, the offer in order to attract uh, the proximity tourism. And uh, I hope, I believe, I'm convinced that uh, uh, in the near future, not so near, unfortunately, uh, also this uh, low uh, distance uh, tourists will be replaced by the international tourists. In order to conclude, I would like to remind you two things. First, that uh, of course, I'm a, a university professor, so I'm publishing my, my, my work. I mean, I mentioned one volume which was published together with, the, by the way, Massimo Castellano, who is, uh, who is an entrepreneur um, uh, on, on this kind of issues on the area, coastal area around Rome. Then uh, just uh, a few days ago, um, it was published in international journals uh, uh, my, my, my work, my contribution in order to understand the, the problem of uh, uh, this problem of tourism before and after the COVID. Um, I also uh, have to remind that uh, I've been coordinating a major project on coastal area financed by the European Commission. And, uh, and there we published seven volumes and uh, tens of uh, articles in scientific journals. I'm not selling because all this work are uh, access free, open access. And so if anybody of you are interested, I will be pleased to, to send you copies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Montanari. He's currently managing uh, an important study concerning uh, the blue tourism uh, in the Lazio region. And I hope to have the possibility to, to see and to share the result of this activity very soon. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Paolo, for the final session. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, we, uh, yeah. we thank again all the speakers, uh, of course, for these precious uh, contributions uh, on today's focus. Uh, before passing on to a brief question and answers uh, session, 
We wish to thank uh, our global web audience for being with us during this long focus on Mediterranean uh, tourism. And in particular, we wish to express our gratitude to Sarah Carr from uh, Octo Group in the USA. Without her support and understanding, we wouldn't uh, be able to uh, have this webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we also thank our friends from Ascame, of course, uh, Bianca, Annabel, and Luis. Uh, and the technical staff in Barcelona has been very patient with uh, all the guests and, and, and us, of course. For <laughs> okay, gracias, muchas gracias, for their support and partnership. Uh, uh, so, if you have any outstanding requests and, or questions, please mail to uh, info habitat world one word dot net. And uh, now we have at least uh, a couple of questions uh, after we, we have seen the uh, uh, presence on the, uh, on the chat of uh, at least three continents. We had uh, Michelle from British Columbia, uh, Candy from the Canary Island, and uh, Afid from Zanzibar, Tanzania, and many others. And Yorgos, of course, from, uh, from Greece. Uh, we have uh, a couple of questions. The first one was addressed to the uh, uh, European Commission uh, representative the DG Mare, uh, Dr. Aziani, I hope she's, uh, she's still there. And uh, she, the, the question is, uh, is there a role for public-private partnership in, in the future uh, projects of uh, European Commission uh, uh, Department, DG Mare? Dr. Aziani. Uh, hello. Uh, well, um regarding the engagement of uh, private and public sector together there are several ways and several initiatives which can be uh, performed we can mention some of that but uh, as, as a general comment is that in the current projects and in the future projects and in the future program the engagement of public and the private sector in very is very significant uh, we have mentioned also before during the presentation that is very important also in terms of uh, the activities of clusters. Uh, we have presented uh, a few examples of uh, significant maritime clusters as they have been described in a, in a new report of the of the Mediterranean, which is uh, very crucial for engagement uh, of uh, uh, private and public sector together. And also coming to the regional level, uh, the implementation of the smart specialization strategies, which uh, are um, focusing uh, also among the other pillars on tourism sector as well for many regions, uh, is very crucial to engage together the private and the sector, uh, the, uh, the private and the public sector also together with the research and the academia for um, uh, having a new innovative project in different uh, in pillars, but also in uh, sustainable tourism. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a kind answer. And we also have one question for uh, the uh, uh, Union of the Mediterranean, the Secretary General, Her Excellency Isidro Gonzalez Alfonso. Uh, for you, we, uh, we have a, just a question that uh, speaks about uh, uh, waters. Uh, how much, uh, how the, the water uh, is, is uh, linking uh, the, these matters because the future depends on water. So there is a question uh, of uh, humanity relationship uh, with the water, uh, how much this is impacting on the future policies of uh, development for the tourism in, in Europe, the water issue. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this question coming from my homeland, the Canary Islands. I'm from, I was born there. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, there is already a, 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 from the beginning a, a very important problem. In, in the Mediterranean, we have 3% of the, uh, the, of the, uh, of the water, uh, of the world, 3% only, but we have 7% of the population. There is this, uh, there is uh, from the beginning a mismatch. 3% of the water, uh, of the whole world, uh, we have it in the Mediterranean, uh, fresh water and drinkable water, but only, uh, but, but we have 7% of the population. So this is uh, a lot. So we have a, we have a problem of a scarcity. <laughs> there are countries in, in the Mediterranean or next to the Mediterranean, like Jordan, which are the, the Jordan is, for example, the second uh, country in the world uh, with, uh, with the highest level of uh, water stress. What is, water stress is a, 
uh, the difficulty to access to water is the, is the second country in the world with more difficulty to access to water in Jordan and it is there it is next to the Mediterranean uh, and, and there are other countries in our region uh, where the access to water is, uh, is increasingly difficult and because of water uh, water access we have, have have not not less than almost 40 uh, violent conflicts, almost wars, and sometimes wars in, in the world, eh? and some of them near our area. And, and it, it is also the lack of water and the difficulty of access to water is forcing mass migration uh, in, in many occasions and it's forcing people to get in desperate uh, to abandon their homeland, their country, uh, sometimes to risk their life by taking a, a stingy boat to cross the Mediterranean and, and, and in some occasions losing their lives. Uh, so this is a drama. Uh, and we have to make clear that nobody is leaving his country, his city, his region, unless he, he doesn't have another option. So uh, of course, the, the link between uh, water and humanity is a, is, a, is a priority. And I said during my intervention at the beginning that we had to change the, the habit of consumption and production. Uh, for instance, in the production of food, and the food industry, uh, we are uh, uh, using or wasting almost uh, 60 or 70 percent of the, of the water, of the whole water we are consuming in, in the world. This is, this is huge. So we have to change the way of producing, producing food, for instance, and the way of consumption. Uh, we have to make it sustainable. Uh, and first of all, in this work, our job has to be has to be in the schools. We have to raise awareness, raise awareness to our children from the very beginning that this is a problem, this is an issue, we have to save water, we have to uh, streamline the use of water, we have to uh, use it in a sustainable way. Okay? So thank you for the question. Okay, okay thank you again, uh, uh, His Excellency. Um, well, this is the end of, uh, of the day of this, uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so we have we understood one thing we have to reinvent ourselves as well as uh, as tourists and uh, become travelers rather than tourists as, as somebody uh, mentioned uh, the Tres Salupi during this uh, this great uh, uh, opportunity event okay thank you everyone again and uh, see you next time with the, the next events on this matter thank you again thank Gracias. you so much thank you thank you very much thank you very much bye bye thank you bye 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 thank you bye bye, bye. bye. thank you Thank you.